Well, happy Sabbath to everyone. It's good to see you. We were up in uh, Michigan last weekend on a, a tubing trip down the river, and you just never know what kind of weather you're going to receive in Michigan. And as we were leaving, a tornado touched down, so uh, thankful that we made it out of there safely and back home where the weather is beautiful here today. So bear with me this afternoon. We have a little bit of history to go through to get to the topic that I want to discuss. So in 1620, we're going to discuss some American history. So in 1620, the Pilgrims and Quakers came over from England. They brought over the Geneva Bible, which was written before the King James Bible. They elected a governor and then elected seven assistants that were members of their church to help out the governor, to give him guidance and direction. The strict believers of Christ's words were the New Testament. They, were, they wanted to keep it to, God, to God's word. They believed in private property. They bought and traded with the Indians and they wanted to evangelize. Let's turn to 1 Timothy 5, 8. 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So they took scriptures to heart during this time. They were hard workers. They said if you don't work, you don't eat. You have to get out and work with the family. For scripture says that if you don't work, it's worse than an unbeliever. Hebrews 11 verse 13 have you ever wondered where the term pilgrim come from why why are they called pilgrims Hebrews 11 13 these all died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off were assured of them, embraced of them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who said such things declare this plainly, that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better place, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So this is what William Bradford, he was the journalist for the pilgrims, and this is the scripture that they used to come up with the, their name pilgrims coming to the United States. Do you know the schools in the United States were originally set up by the churches for the purpose of Bible teachings? They wanted to teach the children scripture. In 1690, Connecticut established a literacy law with a fine of $25, which was extremely high during that time. $25 for those who were not able to read. So they wanted everyone to read the scriptures, and if you couldn't read, you were to find an incredible amount. Also in 1690, Benjamin Harris, New England's primer, was the textbook, and it was a memorization of the alphabet that was introduced using scripture to teach reading and pronunciation. This primer was reprinted and used for 210 years until 1900. John Adams said, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. And I have several old books here that were 
the teachings in the 1800s. This is the fifth reader and some of the words out of it. This is uh, 1875. It says, mankind are besieged by war, famine, and pestilence. Charity is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly. It is not easy, easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth in the truth, bear all things, believeth all things, hope in all things, endureth all things. Page 155, the topic is mercy. And it's uh, specific quotes of, from Shakespeare regarding the attributes of God himself. It talks about how to live, the house of God, rebuking, all based on biblical principles. Do our books today and our school systems base teachings off of biblical principles? This book is, let's see, the, the Constitution of Man. It's a science book in 1850. It described the study of man and human nature as being focused on understanding what exists and its purpose not for reasons of any kind that would oppose God or his fixed laws. This is the third reader, 1869. It says the good are beautiful. It talks about the true secret of happiness, the pilgrim and the rich knight, counsels to the youth, it talks about disobedience and that humanity is rewarded, honesty, truthfulness. Examples are all related to Bible teachings. A little bit more history of the United States. July the 4th, 1776, we know that our nation declared its freedom from England and wrote the Declaration of Independence. Our founding fathers then began to define our Constitution. Some of the same debates back then still exist today with government. Should we have a small government? Should we have a large government? It talks about human rights, religious rights, Imagine our founding fathers trying to create laws based upon human rights and religious rights. How would you do it? It took them 11 years to write our Constitution from the independence. September the 17th, 1787, our founding fathers defined our laws of the land, the United States Constitution. The Constitution originally consisted of seven sections. One through three was for the federal government. Four through six was defined for the state government. And seven was created for ratification of the law. There were a total of five pages on parchment paper. That's it, five pages. A year later at the state convention, Many argued that it did not provide sufficient safeguard for the rights of the individual. James Madison wrote 12 safeguards, 10 of which were adopted. Those 10 were known as the Bill of Rights. They looked upon them as the 10 Commandments of the Constitution. The Bill of Rights, protecting our freedom of speech and our freedom of religion. It has been amended and amended multiple times. There is always a politician that wants to change it or in their mind, improve it. Could you imagine Moses when he came with the Ten Commandments saying to God, God, I'm going to amend eight of the Ten Commandments. I don't think that would work with God the Father. 
back to the Bill of Rights. So let's focus on this today with the history that we've just read. The First Amendment. The First Amendment to the Constitution reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of press or the right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So this was uh, in 1791, four years after the Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise of speech, press, or the right for people to assemble. During that time, and still today, the United States is a melting pot of different religious groups. And don't forget, during that time, they also interacted with the Indians who prayed to the spirit gods. Christianity was introduced to North America as it was colonized by the Europeans in the 16th and 17th centuries. The Spanish, the French, and the British brought Roman Catholicism to the colonies of New Spain, New France, Maryland, while Northern European peoples brought Protestantism to Massachusetts Bay Colony, New Netherland, the Virginia Colony, Carolina Colonies, and Lower Canada. Among the Protestants was Anglicanism, the Baptist Church, Congressional congregation, con Congregationalism, Presbyterianism, Lutheranism, Quakerism, Mennonites. So today, let's focus on the First Amendment. The argument is, how is it defined? I ask you, what is your definition of the First Amendment? Politicians argue about it today. Congress shall make no law an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press that the people can peaceably assemble. Our society is changing drastically due to our government's leaders making changes to our nation's law based upon their interpretation of the First Amendment. The primary question is this, does this mean that we are to have a government that separates church and government? Should we have a government in the United States that separates church and government, church and state? As a follow-up question, does God define how governments are to rule? Does he say to be one or to keep politics and religion separate? Does God define how governments are to rule? Does he say to be one or to keep politics and religion separate? What are your thoughts? Does it coincide with scripture? We'll review the results of our current nation of this year. Lastly, does God define how his future government will be? Does God define how his future government will be? Will it be one? Or will politics and religion be separate? The First Amendment to our Constitution says Congress shall make no law. The Constitution left the religious liberties to the states. That's the way it was originally defined. To leave it up to the states, 
not to have a big government in control. Federal government was not to get involved. Much debate began with Thomas Jefferson echoing the language of the founding, the founder of the First Baptist Church in America, Roger Williams, who had written in 1644, a hedge or wall of separation between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world. Jefferson wrote, I contemplate with sovereign, sovereign reference that the act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Many people take this phrase as meaning there should be two separate entities and that they should not be tied together. So let's look at a couple case studies. Let's look at a couple examples that we can read. The first one was 1925. The Supreme Court was involved in a man passing out his agenda of socialism. It was called Gitlow versus New York. This was an issue of freedom of speech. The New York Supreme Court a federal court had decided that anyone who advocated the doctrine of violent revolution violated the law. Freedom of speech. Now we'll look at the freedom of religion. In 1940, the Supreme Court ruling Cantwell versus Connecticut. Here the court applied the free exercise clause of the First Amendment to the states. Again, religion was a state matter. State courts were, and are, completely capable of handle, handling these issues. Nevertheless, the Supreme Court, in direct opposition to the original intentions of the Constitution, applied its portion of the Bill of Rights to the states. The case Jesse Cantwell and his son were Jehovah's Witnesses. They were spreading their gospel among a Catholic neighborhood in Connecticut. The Cantwells distributed religious materials by traveling door to door, as the Jehovah Witness do, and they were approaching people on the street. After voluntary hearing an anti-Roman Catholic message, on a uh, portable phonograph, two, two pedestrians acted angrily. So the Cantwells were subsequently arrested for violating a local ordinance that required a permit for solicitation and for inciting a breach of peace. So the question, did the solicitation statute or the breach of peace ordinance violate their First Amendment of, free, of speech or free exercise as a rights. The conclusion, the federal court said yes in a unanimous decision. The federal court held that while general regulations on solicitation were legitimate, restrictions based on religious grounds were not because the statute allowed local officials to determine which cause, causes were religious and which ones were not. It violated the first and 14 amendments. The court held that while the maintenance of the public order was a valid state of interest, it cannot be used to justify the suppression of free communication of views. The message was offensive to many in that area, but it did not entail or threat bodily harm and was protected under religious speech. So as we look today at our government and our states, making changes. How does it affect us today as Christians? Current issues of a nation that has a government separate from religion. 
Well, it is legal to marry more than one wife if it's due to religion. It's legal now to marry the same sex and companies pay for the partner health benefits. It is illegal to display the Ten Commandments in public places such as our schools, our courthouses. There is no longer prayer in the school system. Abortions are, are legal. School systems now teach uh, safe sex and they pass out condoms. All religious groups are accepted. Groups that don't follow Christ. We know that uh, Christians are beheaded. Um, it is acceptable for groups that worship Satan and even anti-religious groups, atheists, agnostics. It's easy to file and become divorced in our society. It's very easy to sue your brother. Our leaders do not have to be righteous. Anyone with enough votes can enter an office. Do you know our, our laws are nicknamed the Godless Constitution? Nowhere is God mentioned in the Constitution, not one time, except for where it says that it was created in the year of our Lord. Like all nations in the world, throughout their history, China, Russia, Japan, Europe, there has been revolution after revolution of religious battles resulting in the loss of many lives. What does God say concerning how governments are to rule? Let's turn to scripture today and review that. 1 Samuel 8 verse 1 is where we'll begin. First Samuel 8, 1, the title is Israel Demands a King. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made the sons, that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah, and there were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, perverted justice. Verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to God. He asked for God's help. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day with which they have forsaken me and served their gods, so they are doing to you also. Verse 9. Now therefore heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So this is a warning from Christ that Samuel to tell the people. So Samuel ta told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said... This will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over thousands of, and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be performers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields and your vineyards. 
and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants and your female servants, your finest, young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that all the king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all these words of the people and repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, Heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Every man shall go to his city. So we do read that the people demanded a king and they were warned of the outcome. They would take their sons, their daughters, and he would take the tenth and rule over them. Who was the king that was put into place? It was Saul. Saul became the king to fight the nations, not God himself. And as we know, Saul was a head taller than everyone else. He was a very large individual. And he was looked up upon as the king. We know Saul's history and the issues that he had with fighting demons. Saul's issue of being replaced as a king, wanting to kill David, a man after God's own heart. Psalm 11:7 says, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. Jeremiah 21:11 says, Execute judgment in the morning. Execute judgment in the morning. There is law and that men are to be held accountable. Let's turn to Jeremiah 22 verse 11 Jeremiah 22 11 the message to the sons of Josiah for this says the Lord concerning Shalom the son of Josiah king of Judah who reigned instead of Josiah his father who went from this place he shall not return here anymore but he shall die in the place where they have led him captive and he shall see this land no more woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work who says, I will build myself a wide house with spacious chambers and cut out windows for it, paneling it up with cedar and painting it with vermilion. Shall you reign because you enclose yourself in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then it was well was not the knowing me says the Lord yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing but your covetousness for shedding innocent blood and practicing oppression and violence so we see a warning to the kings and the rulers sounds a lot like slavery here making people work without wages making them build your house without paying them. Let's turn to Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19 verse 15. 
You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. This scripture is talking about showing no favoritism, that we are to love our neighbor. It's one of the two great commandments to love your neighbor. People, governments, the governors, state representatives, are to exercise justice and righteousness as individuals. Civil rulers are to be righteous. This is almost impossible today in today's system when we have officials that are not righteous, officials that lack morals and ethics. They lack the belief and faith of Jesus Christ. Let's turn to Romans 13, verse 1. Romans 13, verse 1. The title is Submit to the Government. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So it's saying here that the leaders are appointed by God, and they're in position because of God's desire. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Verse 4, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, avenger, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscious sake. For because of this, you shall also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So we as Christians are not to seek vengeance because we know that the Lord says vengeance is mine. It is not ours. We are to get along with our neighbors, our co-workers, and even our politicians. We are to help, we are to pay taxes, to help take care of our roads, to help take care of people that are not physically able to work, to chip in and pay the social security for our senior citizens. We know that time after time, God has placed the leader in the office. He has a purpose. And we know that God knows best. We are to obey the laws of the land, of course, unless they contradict with God's law. Let's turn to Acts 14, verse 13. Acts 4, I'm sorry. Acts 4. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside, go aside out of the council they conferred among themselves saying what shall we do with these men for indeed 
that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it but so that it spreads no further among the people let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name so they didn't want them to speak of Christ at all so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus verse 19 but Peter and John answered and said to them whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge so what's more important to listen to God the Father or to listen to these men that said to keep the word of Christ quiet don't talk about Christ or his miracles anymore as Christians we are not to deny Christ we are to spread the word of Christ of the kingdom of God concerning government God has established principles for the governing kings people get into power into office and greed sets in they're surrounded by the good things in life by money and a lot of times sin creeps in let's read Deuteronomy 17 verse 14 chapter 17 and we'll read 14 through 20 and the title is principles governing kings when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me just as we read in Samuel and you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord God chooses one from among your brethren and you shall set king over you so as we read here in verse 15 this king is from among the brethren that has a religious background and same beliefs you shall set the king over you you may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother but he shall not but he shall not multiply horses for himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses for the Lord said to you you should not return that way again neither shall he multiply wise for himself lest his heart turn away nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself and also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from one before the priest the Levites and I shall be with him and he shall read it in the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of the law and the statutes that is his heart may not be lifted above his brethren that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left and that he may prolong his days in the kingdom and his children in the midst of Israel so this brethren is talking about a king that is that has a like mind of us and that he's not to multiply, he's not to collect gold, he's not to uh, have a large government. It should be small and he should be humble. God knew that greed would set in in a big government to try to take control over the people. Look at the pharaohs in Egypt. What did they do to build the pyramids? 
they grew a large kingdom they collected the gold and they had slavery so what is our Christian duty today our Christian duty today is to pray for all men to pray for all men to pray for those in our government locally and nationally let's turn to 1st Timothy 2 1 1st Timothy 2 1 through 4 therefore I exhort first of all that supplications prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and all who are in authority that may, we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence for this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth so that is our desire as well that all men be saved and come to the same knowledge that we have that we are to pray for all men to pray for the rulers of our nation back then they were to pray for the Roman emperors they were to pray for Saul at that time Saul was murdering the Christians turned into Paul yes we are even to pray for our president Obama and for our next president as we have our debates at this time let's turn to Colossians 3 verse 1 Colossians 3 1 through 5 if then you were raised with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ is setting at the right hand of God set your mind on things above not on things of earth for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God when Christ who is our life appears then you also will appear with him in glory therefore put to death your members which are on the earth put to death the fornication the uncleanliness the passion the evil desire the covetousness which is idolatry we are told to meditate on what God is doing on God's plan of salvation as the verses state do you want to appear with Christ in glory when he returns do you want to be with Christ if so we need to believe what God tells us in his word we need to be willing to do what God commands each and every one of us so now we'll look at our future government Scripture makes it very clear that Jesus Christ seated at God's right hand will come back to rule the nations of the earth as King of Kings so now we will look at our future government during the kingdom of God Revelation 11 15 is our first scripture Revelation 11:15 is during the seventh trump then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever he shall reign from this point on God's inspired word tells us of Christ being in our past with Moses and of Christ being in our future 
Let's turn to Acts 3, verse 19. Acts 3.19 Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that, who will not hear that prophet, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So if you don't receive Christ and his words, you will be destroyed. Verse after verse, the Bible shows that God will restore his government from the very beginning of the Bible to the very end. His law will be restored completely. His way of life will be restored for all mankind here on earth. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and will remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. We shall always be with the Lord. In our mind's eyes, we should picture the glory of Christ's return as King of Kings. The great shout of the archangel announcing the arrival of the earth's ruler, Jesus Christ. The mighty blast of the last trumpet. The inspired prayers of the saints says very clearly that Christ has made the true saints kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on earth. Revelation 5, Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and, you, and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue, and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth the kingdom of God will be established brethren our job is to stay on path as Christians we are to pray for our rulers and government and look forward to Jesus Christ's return Revelation 20, verse 6. Revelation 26. It says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this is talking about the millennium after Christ returns will reign with him for a thousand years it describes the reward of God's saints to join Christ's ruling kingdom 
Revelation 2.25, words of Christ. Revelation 2.25, Jesus Christ said, But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. Shall, they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I have also received from my father. So we are to rule with a staff as a shepherd. We are to serve. We are to follow in Christ's footsteps, loving and merciful, and correct when needed. Those true Christians who overcome themselves, their sin, who overcome the world, who overcome Satan, will be given awesome responsibilities under Jesus Christ in ruling the nations and straightening out the problems in today's society. We will rule under Jesus Christ. So what is Jesus Christ's plan for his government? Who will rule directly under Christ? Let's turn to Romans 4, verse 1. Romans 4, 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father is found according to the flesh? Verse 5, but to him who does, does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Verse 7, it says, Blessed are those who lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So we know that God does have a special place in his rulership for Abraham, his faithful servant, and for David, a man after his own heart. Let's turn to Matthew 8. Verse 11. Matthew 8. Verse 11. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and set down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out in their outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we read here in verse 11 that there's also a special place uh, mentioned again for Abraham, Isaac, and also Jacob in the kingdom. They are outstanding servants of God through the ancient times, and they will be in God's top positions in the kingdom. God described David of ancient Israel as a man after my own heart, who will do all my will in Acts 13, 22. What about the 12 apostles? Let's turn to Matthew 19, 28. Nineteen twenty-eight says, and this is Christ talking. So Jesus said to them, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Speaking of the twelve disciples.
For even the Apostle Paul, not speaking in parables, in 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3 said, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Can you judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Those, those fallen angels will be judged. How much more things that pertain to this life? Will you be a righteous judge? Will you be a fair judge? Impartial. For nearly 2,000 years, various scholars, monks, bishops, and theologians have desperately tried to water down the consistent teaching of Scripture that there is a government that will be set up on this earth under direct rulership of Jesus Christ and the resurrected saints. There will be a government. Yet the early Christians all understood and believed this and the inspired truth in Scripture. In the book of Daniel, Almighty God revealed that at the time of the end, the kingdoms will be given to his saints. Daniel 7, 27. Seven twenty-seven says, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This was written in 605 B.C. Daniel, during that time, knew that Christ would return and establish his government on earth. Throughout the generations, this is the same message. It doesn't change. It's the same message, brethren. We have also seen that Christ and the Father have a specific governmental structure planned with definite responsibilities outlined for Abraham, Moses, David, the apostles, and I'm sure other saints, that their responsibility of ruling over individual cities or specific departments in Christ's government. Ruling from the capital of Jerusalem. What an exciting life we have just ahead of us, brethren, to be a part of the government of God.